uh, I wanted to be able to introduce the additional complication, an addition to this model that makes it more realistic. And you have seen the LC circuit in your lab. Uh, so this uh, suggests that it will oscillate forever, and it doesn't actually oscillate forever. The oscillation dies down because of the resistance that has to be somewhere in the system. So the more realistic system is really LRC circuit, and the way you do model it is with a register that's somewhere here. And when we start looking at it, this gets fairly complicated. And if we try to do it the exact same way we did it for, in, um, for simple harmonic oscillator in physics 4A, it, it's very, it gets much more difficult. So this is the motivation for me introducing what we introduced the last time, complex exponentials. So, and so I will admit that this portion of what we are covering in the course is not quite standard in the sense that um, so, you know, I've been GSI at, uh, for Physics 7 at Berkeley for, well, I guess I was only one semester. Anyways, I've been <laughs> GSI for Physics 7 at Berkeley, so I know how much material they cover. And I can tell you that UC Berkeley Physics 7 b does not cover complex exponentials. It's because um, it, it's just not in the standard sequence. But I don't think that uh, it has to be that way because everything that we talk about with the complex exponential is something that you already know. It's something that is covered in pre-calculus. So what we, as a reminder, what you has covered in pre-calculus is this Euler's formula. E to the i theta is equal to cosine of theta plus i sine theta. And um, so what we spent some amount of time last time is justifying this formula because now that you are, you have taken math 3B, you actually know the mathematical tool for proving that this formula is correct. So we went over that last time. And what I want to spend a little bit of time today is analyze this LRC circuit uh, with this as our guess for what the charge on the capacitor should be. Our guess for the charge on the capacitor is going to be Q as a function of time will be some, um, some complex number times um, e to the, let's see, how do I want to write this? Mm, let me write it this way. e to the um, some, con I can't use C. What can I use? I don't want to use Z. Um, <clears throat> let me use the rule. Um, so it's a bit of a non-standard usage, but let me use, rule is not good either. Let me use B. I, I think B is the least confusing among <laughs> anything I can pick. E to the B times T. And what I want to emphasize here is that this is going to be a complex number. And this time, we are going to allow this to be a complex number. When we went through this first time, uh, we didn't allow the exponential to be complex. That's why we went back and did the oscillatory solution. This time, we are going to allow this to be complex. Not imaginary or real, but a combination of imaginary and real part. Okay. So uh, let's, uh, let me step back through the proper LRC circuit and just uh, go through the Kirchhoff's rules again so that we have a proper equation of motion that we are going to solve for. So this is the LRC circuit. You have a capacitor, and let's say this capacitor is charged to um, at time at time t equals zero, this capacitor is charged to some positive charge q naught and negative charge q naught. So that part um, is the same as before, and this capacitor is hooked up to an inductor, same as last time. And we will say that the, we, the way we have this set up, the amount of current that flows at time equals zero is zero. So we close the switch at time equals zero, and the inductor forces current not to change it so suddenly. It has to change at a finite rate. And the new part that we are going to introduce now is the register. 
So this is what we want to analyze. The question we ask is the same question we ask for every other circuit. Um, what is the current as a function of time? And what is the, um, you could, I guess whenever you have capacitor, you can ask it two different ways. You can ask it in terms of voltage. Um, that's the one I, I actually prefer. But whenever you have capacitor, the voltage across capacitor is proportional to the charge. So voltage or charge. So the, the same two questions that we ask for any circuit is what is the current? And what is the voltage difference across a particular element? And if you're talking about the capacitor, this will be related to the amount of charge on the capacitor. OK, okay. so we are going to use the same approach that we use for every single circuit since the DC circuit days. We are going to use Kirchhoff's rules. So we, um, this is a simple circuit with no junctions, no, no non-trivial junctions. So we are just going to use the loop rule. We define this loop starting from here, going around this way. Yeah. So I, I'm going, uh, rushing through this because you have seen this uh, at least a half a dozen times, if not a dozen times by now. So um, this is the Kirchhoff's, yeah, Kirchhoff's, of loop rule, which says that if I add up all the changes of voltage as I go around the loop, that adds up to zero. So say that this adds up to zero. In other words, um, so I start from here. I mark that point with the arrow so that I know where I'm starting. So starting from here, as I go across the capacitor, from negatively charged plate to the positively charged plate, I'll gain some voltage. And the amount of voltage I gain is Q over C, because I have, oh, I'll write it down here for those of you who haven't memorized it yet, because I have these relationships memorized. The voltage change across a register is current times resistance. Voltage change across capacitor is the charge divided by capacitance. Voltage change across an inductor is inductance times di dt. So um, you should have it memorized, or you know, if not, have it on your formula sheet. Um, you should have it memorized and have it on your formula sheet, really. Um, so that's the voltage rise as I go across the capacitor. As I go across the register, now I have a drop in voltage. So this is the term that we didn't have before uh, before I introduced the register there. So now I'm going to have a, uh, it's going to be voltage drop, right? I'm saying this is the positive, oh wait, I changed my label. Uh, let me not confuse myself and flip this around so that the direction of the loop is the same direction as the direction of current. So as the positive current flows this way, the voltage across the register will be a voltage drop. So minus IR. And as I go across the inductor, should my voltage drop or rise? So I want you to think of the initial condition at the very initially. Initially it's charged and as current just begins to flow. So, um, so yeah, as current begins to flow, so as I is uh, starting from zero, rising to a very small value, as it rises to some small positive value, I get a voltage drop here. And here, should I get a voltage drop or rise? Drop, right? Because this didn't drop all of this voltage, so it, this has to drop the remainder of the voltage so that the loop adds up to zero. So here, this is what I'm going to write down. It's minus L di dt. And I just convinced myself that, I'm, to make it concrete, I'm thinking of the very in, initial condition, the time slightly after zero. My di dt is going to be positive, because I'm imagining positive current beginning to flow and increasing in value. So this uh, whole combination minus L di dt is a negative value as I expect it to be. Yeah. So all of this is equal to zero. So, all right. Um, I stare at the 
a little bit, um, for a little while like I've done before and realized that I have two unknowns, Q and current. They are both a function of time. So um, I have to rewrite this expression in terms of, I guess, in terms of charge Q alone by using the relationship for amount of current through the capacitor. That's given by rate of change of the amount of charge on the capacitor. And um, so this is like third or fourth time we are doing this. I always go through this exercise trying to figure out which sign is it. Should it be plus or minus? So should it, in, in this particular case, should it be plus or minus? So this is how I want you to imagine it. Imagine at time equals zero. You start out with this much charge, and as you let time go from you let time go from zero to a time slightly after zero, what's happening with the amount of charge? Is it increasing or decreasing? That's the same question forever. It, the charge is increasing, decreasing, right? The capacitor is discharging, so charge is decreasing. What's happening with the current? So I guess you have to know about two things. Um, so I'm looking at this, so, so sorry. with the current, is the current going to be positive or negative? Positive, right? So that's the, that's the intuitive sense that you have from understanding what's going on in the circuit. And whichever sign I pick has to agree with that. If it doesn't agree, then it's wrong. So here, you know, I'm not trying to come up with some complex set of rules. I'm just trying to pick a sign that gives me the correct answer. So my current should be positive, and my charge is decreasing. So is it plus or minus? I have to pick a minus sign here, so that with a decreasing charge, dqdt is negative, I get a positive current. I mean, so this is the exercise you need to go through, and you really do need to practice. So all right, so I have that, so that will give me a way to rewrite my equation into this form. Um, so plugging this i for both occurrences of i, I get q over c minus minus so plus uh, r dq dt. Um, and plug this in here again, minus minus, gets me plus again, plus l. I already have a derivative, so it's going to be the second derivative. Second derivative of Q as a function of time is equal to zero. So this is my um, differential equation. And when you put this into standard form, the standard form is, um, well, the, what, I, what I call standard form is uh, <laughs> where I solve this for the highest order derivative. But I uh, guess it won't really help me at this stage. Let me do it anyway. I'll solve it for the highest order derivative. Um, so the second time derivative of Q is equal to, um, so all of this moved over. So it'll be, uh, and then let me write down the next uh, higher order. Do I want to do it that way? Yeah, I'll do it that way. So it'll be minus um, R divided by L, R over L, dq dt, and then the other term that I had last time also, minus 1 over LC, um, q. So this is your second order ordinary differential equation. And if you are taking math 3f, whatever um, differential equations class, they will tell you how to solve this um, differential equation. Um, but for us, um, where you know, we only require math 3b, um, what we are going to do is we are going to guess an answer to this, um, to this equation. So, um, and so last time this is what I said. Um, in physics classes, even when you're at upper division, at graduate level, where you are supposed to know how to solve differential equations, what I claimed was that very often we don't actually do it the way mathematicians do. We have a convenient guess that happens to 
be a correct answer. <laughs> and we simply check our guess. And let me tell you a little bit of secret. About 90% of those conveniently correct answers are exponentials. So I'm just going to guess an exponential. I'm going to guess my answer to solution to this differential equation, q as a function of time. I'm going to guess the answer here is going to be an exponential. So let me say my guess is that this is equal to q naught times exponential of some coefficient times t with a little bit of twist. The twist here, you know, I mean, you might remember us doing this last time, and it didn't go well. But the twist here this time is that these two constant parameters that's here, we are going to allow them to be complex. They may be real. They may be imaginary. They might be a combination of real and imaginary. Complex in the sense of, you know, it can be represented as um, um, A plus IB, where A and B are both real numbers. Yeah. So, so uh, let's plug it in and see. So when you plug it in, this is what you get. So plugging this into this equation, you end up with double time derivative. Well, with exponential, those derivatives are super simple. Each derivative brings down a factor of b, right? So with a double time derivative, I get b squared times q naught all of this, or just uh, um, q as a function of time, is equal to um, this coefficient here, minus r over l times the first, uh, well, um, single derivative with respect to time. So I'll have a single factor of b times b, and the same function again, so q of t minus uh, that uh, 1 over lc times q of t. So you see that q of t simply cancels out from every single term because that's one of the special property of exponential that you learned when you first took calculus that when you take derivative, it doesn't change. And that property doesn't change just because it's now complex exponential. This b can be complex, and that property is still the same. So this simply cancels out from each one of these terms. And this is really why we um, exponential is a convenient to guess. It turns what used to be a calculus problem into an algebra problem. So the resulting expression here is b squared is equal to minus r over l b minus 1 over lc. It's an algebra, it's an algebra expression with an unknown b. So uh, anybody here know how to solve for b here? What do you know that can help you find the b here? Yeah, quadratic formula. It's, it's an algebra problem. So that's a really why we like to use exponential as our first guess. And for many problems, that will be our final guess, the correct guess. And so here, the, this is what used to be calculus problem boils down to an algebra problem of solving for a, a quadratic for equation. So let me put this into an actual standard form for quadratic equations. So, it, so I should move this back. Yeah, I knew I shouldn't have done this. So it'll be b squared plus r over l, b plus 1 over lc is equal to 0. Well, that's the format for quadrat. I knew I shouldn't have used the b. Um, so the way I, uh, uh, let me uh, do a little switch of letters. And instead of a, b, and c that you normally use for quadratic formula, let me use alpha, um, so here the, what I'm going to refer to as alpha is this, one. So alpha, um, this is beta, and um, this uh, is the third letter in the Greek alphabet, gamma. <laughs> so in terms of these new letters, um, the quadratic formula says that b there is equal to uh, minus beta plus minus the square root of beta squared minus 4 alpha gamma over 2 alpha. Right. 
Okay, so just plug in um, these numbers that we have here, and let's see what we get. Um, beta is R over L, so this B is equal to R over L, or minus R over L, plus or minus, square root of, um, R over L squared, R over L squared, minus um, four times uh, one times this, so minus um, four over LC, square rooted. The whole thing divided by um, two times one, so divide by two. Um, let me do a little bit of simplification. Um, I'm going to do two simplifications. The first one will be easier. I'm just going to divide up two into this portion and this portion. So um, this first term will become minus r over 2l. And the next term, 2 will go into square root and get rid of this 4 there. The second simplification deserves a little bit of justification. Um, and this is the part I need, want to, need to want to justify. This here. I'm going to rewrite it as square root of minus 4 over LC minus R squared over L squared. I mean, you know, I mean, yes, this is the same expression as this, but I should motivate why I'm doing this. It's a question of, um, I see two numbers are subtracting, right? And what this square root means has a qualitatively different meaning depending on which of these two quantities are bigger. And you know, in a world where you can freely pick the value of resistance and value of whatever, then this can be anything. It can be 0, it can be minus 1, uh, it can be negative, it can be positive. And um, in fact, if you read about dent simple harmonic oscillator in your textbook when you are studying for physics 4A, we didn't cover that in class because the asterisk the section of your textbook. If you read it, then in fact the value of the sign here is the criterion for describing under than oscillator, critically than oscillator, or over than oscillator. So <laughs> the reason I want to write it this way is uh, when you see um, oscillations like you saw in the lab, when you have an under than system, this quantity here is going to be positive. So I want to write it in a way that the, the quantity that we normally expect to be positive is set by itself. So there's a minus sign here pulled out so that you, uh, so that it's clearer that most of the times this quantity, or, or for the conditions under which you are looking at it, this quantity here is negative. So um, this is, I guess, how I would justify it. It's a matter of how we are picking the value of R. So, you know, uh, we started uh, this uh, in introduction without an actual L LC circuit, the oscillatory circuit. So in the ideal, ideal case, what is the value of R? What is the, um, you know, like ideally you would say it's a zero, right? Zero resistance, zero of anything that's going to cause any energy dissipation. So one, as we s start modeling this resistance R, we are going to start out with a small value of R. So that's where you look at it here. Look at this expression here. If R is zero, then this is zero, and this is a negative non-zero value. So as you increase the value of R, this whole thing is going to get less and less negative. At some value of R, it'll be zero. That's the value of R that critically damps this uh, uh, oscillator. And as you increase R further, you over damp this oscillator. So that's the reason I'm writing it this way. So that when R is equal to zero, the quantity we have here is going to be positive. And it's clear that the whole thing that's inside the square root is negative. As you increase R, it'll eventually become zero. And then if you increase R further, it'll, this will be negative, meaning the whole thing under the square root will be uh, positive. So we, we are not going to deal with the over them to case. We are only going to deal with the under them to case where there's still some amount of oscillation. 
So, so let me uh, do that simplification here. So I already wrote that, wrote that minus r over 2l. So it's going to be plus or minus square root of minus 1 times this quantity here. Um, with the 2 already factored in, so it's going to be uh, 1 over LC minus R squared over 4 L squared. Everyone okay with this expression? Okay, so let me do the, my last the final step. I have a square root of minus 1. Well, that's the imaginary number I. So I'm going to say my B is equal to r or minus r over 2l um, plus or minus and then um, I'm just going to factor this out by itself plus or minus times i and the remainder is going to be a positive number so I can just keep it inside the square root so square root of 1 over lc minus r squared over 4l squared Good. So, so this is the, uh, so it, B is a complex number, as I have been telegraphing from the beginning. This B here, um, for the conditions under which we are looking at it, it's going to be a complex number. And before, before, today, uh, before this Monday, we would have said, that's a nonsense answer, we are going to do something different. What we are saying today is, well, that's not a nonsense answer. That is a meaningful answer. We are going to allow the exponent here to be complex. Yeah. So let me, let me write that out. So with the complex exponent here, this is what the, our guess ends up being. So uh, I guess black is the best color. So with the complex B, this that I'm going to pl plug in and then you know, factor things out to simplify it a little bit, it's going to look like this. So charge as a function of time is equal to some initial charge Q0 times exponential of all of these. So I'm going to write in the first term first and you guys will remember the exponential algebra, right? When things add in the exponent, then when you separate it, it's going to be the product of e to the this times e to the this, right? So I'm going to have e to the minus r over 12 times t, that's the, this time t here. So this, this is one time dependence that's going to be in our solution. And one additional time dependence will come from the second term. It'll be, so, times exponential of plus or minus, and then I'm just gonna copy this in. I times, uh, actually let me do one simplification. I'm going to define a quantity that I'm going to call omega. So this quantity here, I'm going to define this entire square root thing as omega, or the natural, oscillation frequency and so you say plus minus i omega t oops t should be in black omega t okay and we are going to say this is actually a meaningful answer <laughs> 